I'm Molly Anderson, Executive Director of the Nantuck Athenaeum, and I want to welcome you to the final Geshe Lecture of this summer. And before we get started, um, I just want to acknowledge that this whole series um, started in 2005, and it would not be possible without the incredible support of Nan and Chuck Geshe. And I would like to acknowledge the way they make life on Nantucket very special for so many of us. Thank you. <laughs> on Monday night, a number of you I recognize were in the audience to hear Richard Haas. And his work describes a world in disarray. And one of the audience members rose and asked a question about what can we as citizens do to counteract this world in disarray. And I think it's fitting tonight that we end this summer series with two people who are doing just that, making a difference in Africa and other countries around the world and making our world a better place. So I'm really looking forward to sharing these two very special people with you. The first one is Pam Allen. And she received her undergraduate degree from Amherst College and a master's in education from Teachers College, Columbia University. She's a teacher, an educational entrepreneur, and an author of 27 books. In 1990, Pam created Books for Boys, a widely replicated reading initiative for foster care kids. In 2001, she founded Lit Life, a groundbreaking teacher training initiative. And in 2007, Pam founded Lit World, a renowned global literacy movement serving children across the United States and in more than 60 countries. Vanessa Carey graduated from Yale with a major in biology and went on to Harvard Medical School. She also earned a Master's of Science in Health Policy, Planning, and Finance from the London School of Economics and the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. She's the founder and CEO of C Global Health, a nonprofit working in 22 sites in five countries and grow to help sustainably change health outcomes through leadership development, having helped train over 8,300 health professionals in Africa in its first three years. Our third guest um, was unable to come, Diana Calvi, who um, is the executive director of Village Enterprises. She had a family emergency on Monday that prevented her from coming from California. But what I would like to do is to show um, just a very short video of what Village Enterprises does in Africa, because I think it sets the stage beautifully for our other two speakers. Um, the way this is going to work is that after I show that video, um, then Pam's going to come and do a short presentation about her program followed by Vanessa, who will do a short presentation of her program. And we're going to pull the chairs up here, and they'll have a bit of conversation together, and then we want to open it up to questions from the audience. So here is Village Enterprises. Our goal is to launch 20,000 businesses and improve the lives of a half a million East Africans. Village Enterprising is a micro-enterprise organization that helps East Africans start small, sustainable businesses. With our model, you provide the seed capital, you provide the business training, the mentoring, and then you don't have to keep providing aid. Village Enterprise was founded by Brian Lynn, and Brian was really a pioneer in the field of microfinance. And he started it because he had witnessed the abject poverty in many parts of the developing world. 
Village Enterprise decided to focus on East Africa because mm -hmm. poverty levels are extraordinarily high. And with the Village Enterprise model, we can help the poor help themselves by creating sustainable businesses. One of the keys to success to the Village Enterprise model is bringing together groups of business owners. When individuals come together, they're more invested in the business and there's a higher level of success. Over two-thirds of our businesses are led by women. Women are more likely to invest in their families. They're more likely to take the profits from their business and invest in education. And by providing them with training, we're really providing them with the tools they need to be successful. 88% of our businesses are thriving after one year. And after three years, 75% of our businesses are still in operation. I think what's really exciting is being able to help people help themselves. And I think one of the problems with the traditional aid models is you bring something to people, but then you have to keep bringing it to them. With the Village Enterprise model, we're really helping them be able to provide for their families, helping them send their children to school. We're helping the entrepreneurs help themselves. Do I need this too or not? No. Yeah. That would, okay. I see. I see. I see. That's weird. Okay. So, um, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for having us here. It's really a, a joy to be here and to have the opportunity to talk about the work I do and to hear about Vanessa's work and to be together in a conversation tonight. So, um, I, um, I do need a clicker. Do, do, can I use, do you have a? Or, okay, well, that's good. Um, so I love to have a clicker. I don't usually have a clicker with me. Um, but um, I, I, I want to just begin by saying that um, in that video, um, I'm sorry that Diane couldn't be with us tonight, but um, just to kind of s connect us all here and in the work that I do and Vanessa does and Diane does, is in thinking about how um, we together do create worlds, um, we, we all have the power uh, to make a story, to tell a story, to be part of a story in which everybody together has, has the power to change their own lives. And so um, the work I do is I founded an organization called Lit World, um, which is, a, a, my, I, I'm a literacy educator, and, um, and I, I think a lot about the power of literacy. And the way I would describe literacy to you tonight is I, I'll define it as reading, writing, speaking, listening, and viewing, also viewing. The way we read the world and we read words. And if you think about literacy itself as a tool, it's as fundamental and foundational to the life you live as, as breathing. When you breathe, you're hardly even thinking about breathing. It's just that natural as you're sitting here. You're hardly thinking about your breath. And the minute you can't breathe, you think all about it. If you're swimming deep down into the water and you suddenly find yourself at a loss for that, it feels hard and it feels like it could be really scary. For people in the world without literacy, that is what having no literacy feels like. It's, it's catastrophic. And having literacy feels effortless. It feels like we look around and we see words everywhere we go. We see words on signs. We see words in our news. We see words on the, on the TV screens. We see words on our text messaging, on our phones. Everywhere we go, we, we are absorbing, we're marinating, we're ingesting words. And words are also a source of comfort and inspiration. So if you think about for yourselves about when you were young, a book or a story or a poem or a letter, a love letter or a letter from a grandmother that meant something to you, that is a comfort to you. That even years later you open that up and you see that person's handwriting or you look at that email and you say, that, that thing, that really comforts me, that really uplifts me. I'm from New York City and after 9-11 there was a lot of poetry that went back and forth. Everybody was sharing poems. 
And the poet laureate at the time was a man by the name of Billy Collins. He's a great poet. And somebody asked the question to, of him, how come so many people are sharing poetry? And he said it's because poetry tells the story of the human heart. And that's really true. But it's not just poetry. It's also the stories that children tell each other. It's the stories that you read, whether you're reading Charlotte's Web or Stuart Little or any of the stories that you might remember or that you might be reading to your children or grandchildren. And so story matters, words matter, language matters. And the truth of it is that literacy is actually humankind's greatest innovation because it is a flexible innovation that as the world changes, it's the one thing that stays true. Every single generation, we started around campfires telling stories. Ben Franklin made this incredible printing press that made it possible for lots and lots of people to get magazines in their hands. Then this amazing guy comes along, Steve Jobs, with this cool thing that you read on, on a device. He made the computer really small. He made it into a phone so that you can tell stories to each other. You can read stories and share stories and share love and wonderings and curiosity and challenges with other people. All those things, those technologies are innovations, but the real innovation is literacy itself. It's the paper you read on a Sunday morning. It's the novel you read before you go to bed. It's the message you send to your teenage son saying, are you OK? Literacy comes in all forms. And so what at Lit World, what I wanted to do as a literacy educator is I wanted to think about ways to mobilize local communities for their own literacies. I was curious as to what feels important to each and every community about literacy because people have different reasons why literacy is important to them. Some of the women I work with in the rural areas of, of Kenya are most interested in literacy because it helps them to know how to plan for their crops and to plan for where the water and how the water is moving around the land and they can text message each other and keep in touch. The women I work with in urban Kenya are more likely to think about literacy as a way to get their businesses going. They, we have a group we work with in, in Kibera who the women are all HIV positive and the one thing they wanted their literacy for was to create a Facebook page so they could sell their goods on Facebook and they're doing that really successfully. So there's a hole in the world where literacy isn't. And two thirds of the world's illiterate people are women. And so when you see women and girls not going to high school, not going to be able to get a job, so much of that has to do with this fact that they're not getting access to literacy. And so at Lit World, our dream has been, and the dream that we are seeing come true is that we're working side by side with locally based organizations so that the grandmothers, the mothers, the fathers, the grandfathers, the teenagers in the communities can be the literacy leaders in their communities. So it's not about me going somewhere and teaching everyone how to read. That would just take too long. And I'm very impatient. I like for things to happen quickly. And I think that's, that's really um, a powerful thing to think about how many people around the world really, really want this as badly as we love it. People really want literacy. There's been never any place I've been in the world where children didn't hunger to learn to read. When I was in Liberia for the first time, I asked the women there, why do you want to learn to read and write? And the women said, we, during the war, we were not able to vote. And now we can vote again. And we want to vote with more than our thumbprints. We want to vote with our names. We want to see our names. We also want to know who the candidates are so we can have some power in making a choice as to who's going to get to be president. There's so many reasons for literacy. So I'll share, there's a, thank you, love this guy. Um, a story, Angel um, is one of the many children we work with and she was one of the many children who helped me imagine what could be possible when young people take ownership of their literacy. And Angel and her friends in Kibera, which is a community in Nairobi, in, uh, in Kenya, it's a very large, it's historically called a slum, I don't really like that word. It's an, it's an incredible community of entrepreneurial people who've come from many different rural areas to the city 
and live in, in, in a, a difficult conditions, but are incredibly entrepreneurial. And um, in this community, Angel and her friends said to me, we want to come together to learn to read. We don't want to be alone. It's what Oprah figured out all those years ago about reading is no one really likes to do it alone. You don't have to agree. I mean, I'm always, always asked to be in book clubs, and then I always get so annoyed when I say yes, because I'm very opinionated, as you might imagine, about the books I read. I don't like having to read a book someone tells me to read. And then when I'm in the club, I don't know. Sometimes I don't have the same opinion. And it's hard not to have the same opinion. So I tell the students and the kids that we work with that actually not having the same opinion is a really good thing. It's a good thing to practice that. And so one of the things we did was we created a model called Lit Clubs. And these Lit Clubs are run by the people who live in their communities. And then when the children were out of school in the summer, they said, Pam, let's make bigger Lit Clubs. Let's make them last all summer. Because sometimes our school doesn't even come back in session for so many months. So we created Lit Camps. And our Lit Camps run all summer. And our Lit Clubs, why they run in every single circumstance, in every possible condition you can imagine, out under the trees, inside rooms, in some places, for girls to meet in a lit club is a political act. And so they'll cover the window so nobody knows that the girls are in there learning to read. Reading is dangerous, because reading makes you think. People don't like that, having everybody thinking about things. That stirs us up. It makes girls around the world wonder why they can't go to school when they have their periods, because they don't have any access to sanitary supplies. And these are things that are taboo and hard to talk about, even here. But when you start to read, you start to get empowered. You start to say, that's not really so fair. And I want to go to school, too. And so our lit clubs are all created around this idea that coming together really matters, and created around the idea that Coming together means we're going to exercise the right to have this capacity to read and write, speak and listen, and to look at the world in a new way. So in one of the occasions I was visiting Kibera to this amazing community there, Angel, who's one of our girls in our lit club, I was about two hours late getting there because of so much traffic in the community. And when I finally arrived, I was supposed to have done a big read aloud for the community. And when I got there, Angel was reading aloud to her community. And the thing she said to me when she turned and I took this picture, she said, I've got this. <laughs> that's Angel. And that's exactly what I want to happen, is it's Angel's community. Angel understands her community. She understands the multiple beautiful languages in this community. She understands the challenges her friends and her grandmother face in this community. She's a reader who wants to change the world. She knows and understands her community. And so Lit World's mission and vision is to create local partnerships in which locally based NGOs are working side by side with Lit World to create literacy rich communities for everybody. So just quickly, I'll share with you a very, very short video um, about one of the girls in our lit club. Her name is uh, Medina, and she lives in Uganda. And I'll just tell you just briefly that she lives in, in a very tough part of Uganda, and she um, joined our lit club um, uh, two years ago. And um, last year, or the year before, she joined, now my timing is a little bit mixed up, but she was in the lit club for a couple years. And then um, Disney came to scout out um, for a movie that some of you may have seen called The Queen of Cotway. Oh. Amazing movie. And she was discovered. She was not an actor. And uh, the director said to us that the reason she was chosen was, one, because she has a powerful voice and presence, and two, because she could read the script. <laughs> and almost every main character in this film came from our lit clubs because they can read. So here's Medina. Maybe we can.
We're having trouble with the sound. You know what, you want to start back at the beginning. I'm just going to say it to you, what she's saying, because it is subtitled, but for those of you in the back, you might not be able to see it. Um, but it's worth it to hear what she's saying. So I'll, let me try again. I'm Medina Nawanga. I'm 14 years old, and I'm a Ugandan. I come from Kampala. If you are a girl and you don't have all that curiosity, confidence, if you have your dream, it will remain inside you. No one else will know about your dream. Time will not be there waiting for you to learn how to be confident, to learn how to have that hope. Time won't wait for you. It's you to chase time. The first time when I had this lit club, I had it with Sister Susan. She told me, you have to be confident. You have to have hope in you. You can do everything you want. If you have hope, if you have courage, you're confident. It made me feel like I can do everything that I want to do. And it made me feel like I'm no longer this girl who hides when people come. I'm no longer this kind of Medina who is shy, who can't express herself. I'm now going to become this Medina who is confident, who can give out everything. This name was counting for young actors in different communities in Uganda. And then it just so happened that uh, for the different communities, most of the children that were being recruited, that were actually making it through the auditions, were Lead Club members. I think the Lead Club kind of uh, unlocks the potential among the girls, because the girls are really great, but they just are missing out on that uh, opportunity to, to explore what they can be, to explore who, who they are. I could see myself as more than a girl, because my parents, before they could not afford paying school fees for me, but this spirit, it was just free. It came out like that. And this chance was, I think it opened my doors. It opened my new world. It showed me all this. That's, that's great. Thank you so much. I don't know why her own voice didn't come, but it was nice to kind of commune with her for a moment there. Um, and um, I'll just say that um, Medina is just one wonderful, amazing young woman, but there are so many, many. And Lit World, the problem, our biggest challenge is not having enough lit clubs for everybody who wants them. In every community, there are waiting lists of children who want to be part of this movement because they know and understand the meaning of what literacy can bring and do for them. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Vanessa to share her work. And, um, and I thank you for giving me the moment to be with Medina here. That's the end of my. I'm actually going to open with the video, if I can. So we'll just go to the Firefox. Um, hi, it's a pleasure to see everyone tonight. Um, I was, um, thank you, Pam, for sharing your work. It's really, I mean, I think a lot of what we're going to talk about now, uh, tonight is empowerment. And um, one of the things that, it's under the, yeah. So I think I'm going to open with a video as well, and then we'll chat. Two competing videos going. <laughs> we go to seed, and then we can open up the full screen. There. Great. Thanks. There you go. Yep. Thanks. There's a dire shortage of skilled health professionals in resource limited settings around the world. In Tanzania, for example, there are only 24 nurses and one doctor for every 100,000 people. That's compared to the United States, where there's 980 nurses and 240 doctors for the same population. At Seed Global Health, we believe there's an urgent need to address this growing crisis. 
In 2013, we proudly launched an ambitious project, the Global Health Service Partnership. This groundbreaking program, in partnership with the Peace Corps, places highly skilled medical professionals in countries in Africa. We have 30 unbelievable volunteers working in Tanzania, Malawi, and Uganda, and they're putting a zero of their life working alongside their local counterparts to help change how healthcare is delivered and taught. These volunteers bring deep knowledge, experience, or nothing. And training to communities and health systems in need. This isn't just about sending doctors and nurses. Yeah, just stop. Oh, I can talk. Let's not waste the time. It's fine. Um, so that was a brief introduction to our work, but I'll try to talk more about it now. Um, let me just pull up our slides. Slideshow, and then I'm going to do a lot of back camp super fast. Um, all right. So I'll stay here for the sake of, of clicking and, and the speed. Um, so what the video began to describe is that there is a dire shortage of healthcare workers in the world. It's about 7.2 million right now. And if nothing is done about it, it's going to grow to 18 million by 2035. The problem with this shortage is that where the shortages are is actually where the burden of disease is worse in the world. So sub-Saharan Africa, 70% of the global burden of HIV. 24% of the global burden of disease overall in the world of all diseases but only 3% of the world's global healthcare workforce with which to address that disease. And even more dire, only 1% of the world's healthcare expenditure with which to try to rectify that. In 2006, the World Health Organization actually issued a report that is going to seem probably shockingly obvious to all of you in this room, which is that the probability of survival goes up the more healthcare workers you have. It seems to make sense, right? Well, it turns out it took putting a graphic like this in place and actually calling out this, mis this need for people to start to think about, ah, we're putting medications in the hands of, of people and trying to increase the number of HIV medications that are available. We're building clinics and hospitals, to, but we have nobody actually walking those wall, you know, down those hallways. We have nobody actually delivering those medications that we're putting in the field. We're shipping in emergencies, lots of equipment over, but who's actually opening those boxes? And there was this realization that people were fundamental to a heart, you know, the heart, fundamental heart of a health system in order to make things work. So with that in mind, C Global Health realized that we had to stop this idea of just flying in and flying out, delivering medical care, feeling good about ourselves, and leaving. We had to fundamentally change the model of what we were doing and that there was an opportunity to harness all this interest and excitement in global health and this desire to do good, but to do it in a way that we were actually investing in the health systems that we were working in by empowering the local doctors and nurses to not only be able to provide better care, but to be able to train their successors so that there will be a pipeline of doctors, nurses, midwives for years to come who can provide care and continue to train. But more than that, we realized it was really important for them to be able to support the entire health system. I'm sure many of you have heard about this increase in trying to put community health workers into the field because it increases access to care. And it's a powerful tool to improving care, but it can't be done in isolation. You can't just send community health workers out with a blood pressure cuff and say, identify all the patients in dire need of medical care and not provide the referral base or the support to them to be able to actually care for those patients when they run into them. I was very struck by both videos that we saw tonight, both Diana's video and also Pam's, because if you look at the conditions that these people are living in, it's 2017. There is no excuse to me in 2017 that there should be so such fundamental differences of standards of care in the world and standards of living and access to resources, to water, to education, to health. And SEED is really founded with that idea, that vision, that every person in the world can experience the same quality of health care that we, we can experience here. To just give an example of how this might work, Steve Humphrey is a senior cardiologist. He was a professor and a chair of his department of, of cardiology. 
And he decided to spend a year living in Tanzania, and I apologize, this reformatted, this would actually be Tanzania. Um, living in Tanzania for a year, teaching and training. What Steve did was start to actually inspire his students to believe that they could start to think about how patients should be admitted in the wards. He trained the now head of internal medicine at the largest training institution in Tanzania, who's now trying to create a center of excellence in non-communicable disease for her country. He helped do the first cardiac catheterization in Tanzania. You may sit there and say, why does a country like Tanzania, 44 million, that doesn't have access to some of the most basic healthcare need cardiac catheterization? Because if you set that bar and, the, and, and you start to aspire to that, the entire healthcare system starts to elevate. And government decides to stay in their own country and seek care and not flee, which sends a signal to an entire country about what is possible and what can be done. We were founded with an idea that we could leverage the US government to send its dollars further and to do better, and that we could do this in a cost-efficient way. Cost so our flagship model was a public-private partnership with the US Peace Corps, building on their 50-year history of sending Americans abroad in a culturally sensitive and integrated way, and to capitalize on their administrative structure. They have six to 8,000 Americans abroad at any given time. They have language training. They have medical evacuations. They have housing sorted out, safety, security. And we said, sure, why don't we, we'll just piggyback on that. And the Peace Corps loved it because they were getting asked by countries for more technical support, but they didn't have the capacity to do it. So we brought that technical capacity for the training and the education and the medical care. We also brought debt repayment because it turns out American, and I'll speak to this, getting your medical education or nursing education in America means you're gonna graduate with $170,000 worth of debt on average at the time of graduation which means that you can't go work for the Peace Corps for $5,000 a year unless you have support. So we, our flagship program was built on this idea that we could leverage the US government's model to go farther in a very cost efficient way. Times have change, <laughs> administrations change and priorities change. And so as a result, Seed Global Health has grown beyond that initial flagship model to really build out in response to the demand that we've seen and to build other partnerships and ideas that extend beyond it. We had over 20 requests for partnership last year alone from other countries and other institutions that wanted our services. The thing that we do to really highlight that's different from many other organizations is that we really focus on the education and training and the empowerment of ensuring that there's this lifelong pipeline. You always hear the line, if you teach a man to fish. And that's the idea that we really build ourselves on that is very different than something like a Doctors Without Borders that flies in, provides humanitarian care, but isn't investing in this long-term plan where you work yourselves out of a job and foreign aid is no longer ideally needed. What does this look like? We're now in five countries, Tanzania, Malawi, Uganda, Swaziland, and Liberia. Swaziland has the highest HIV rate in the world with about 30% of its population affected by HIV. In the case of Liberia, we were personally asked by the president of the country to come to her country and help it rebuild after Ebola. We're working with 34 sites in partnership with 22 institutions, all in the last four years. That's been the growth from when we started. We sent over 155 faculty, and we've trained now over 10,000 doctors, nurses, and midwives in our first four years, and we're continuing to grow. Um, I think for the sake of time, I will um, you know, share a very quick story of Ali Asghar Khaki, a Tanzanian medical student who learned how to resuscitate a baby while working with one of our volunteers. He later, when no longer working with the volunteer, was work, walking one of the wards and they saw a baby not breathing and his whole team just kept walking and he said, no, there's a protocol for this. Realized the baby still had a pulse, resuscitated that child, changed the course of that kid's life, changed the course of that family's life but actually realized that with no additional resources, just knowledge, he had this power. So he ended up organizing a training in his own institution for 200 of his colleagues, became a master trainer in this, and now is traveling around Tanzania, and he's teaching others. And if you ask him what he wants to do, he'll tell you he wants to be a Tanzanian doctor who stays in Tanzania and continues training future doctors. The final story I want to share, this is Salome Karwa. She's a nurse in Liberia, was a nurse in Liberia, who was taking care of Ebola patients and she herself got Ebola. She survived 
She didn't just cower after she survived, but she went back to taking care of more Ebola patients. Salome was Time Magazine's Person of the Year in 2014 for her courage and her fight and to represent all of those healthcare workers who were fighting the battle. Salome died two years later in childbirth because there were not enough obstetricians or midwives to accompany her through her labor and deliver safely. In fact, more women died of preventable death from childbirth than Ebola because of the lack of healthcare providers in that country. So what Sea Global Health is trying to do is to ensure that women like Salome have a chance at continuing their courage for years to come, teaching it to their children because they have survived childbirth. So the question is, what are we gonna do in 2017 to ensure that those two standards of care are no longer so far apart, but are close together. And that's what SEED's all about. Thank you. I'm in helpful chairs. We're, we're coming up. I've, I've, we have three microphones. <laughs> I'm going to try to turn one off because I'm sure it's going to make some terrible noise in a moment. I'll just put them in there. Do you want to actually, is your conversation should be open to the audience and we're at that time? What, you say that again? I, should we talk or should yeah. we just open it to not? I don't know. Maybe, do you want to, here's what we could, what, what about this? You do it. All right. What about if, we're just wondering what would be the best thing to do, but I'm wondering actually if we could just take a minute, if everybody could take a minute, if you don't know the person beside you, to quickly introduce yourself to that person and then take a minute to turn and talk. What are you wondering right now? What are you thinking about? What's on your mind in this time that we've just had together? And then Vanessa and I can hear a little bit from you and then we can talk together. How does that sound? So just take two minutes to turn and talk. That's always good. No, I think that's fine. I just think I have a feeling I should have a lot of questions and that's I don't want to waste thinking. their time I with agree. our yeah, chit-chatting. Exactly. As much as I want to, you and I can no, do that No, no, I completely time. agree. <laughs> and this way then that'll just get us going. What time is it exactly? I, want to make sure you're I think it's like 8.40ish is my thing. I'm guessing based on when leave. I went on stage. Okay. Perfect. So you have to leave at like nine. Okay. Our ferry's at nine twenty. Okay. okay. So like I'm gonna I'm gonna okay. I'll just apologize when it's time. So okay. maybe we'll give him one minute and we'll Yeah. Also because I think it's on video, so we probably should cut the show. I know. <laughs> uh, so take just ten more seconds and we'll come back together. So let's come back together. This lady has a good thing. Okay. okay. We're, we we want to open this up actually to your questions because I think there was some discussion of our having conversation, but we realized we could do that in our own time. So um, we wanted to hear from all of you and to have a chance to have a conversation. I saw a question, yeah, here. I'll answer. So the, the, the statement or the question was, there are so many countries that are in need around the world. Why did we choose Africa? And I can speak specifically to SEED in that um, the disparity between the number of healthcare workers and the global burden of disease is the, is the most stark in sub-Saharan Africa. And so again, a quarter of the world's burden of disease is on that one continent, and yet it has the by the very drastically small percentage of healthcare workers. About 70, actually now it's about 90% of countries in sub-Saharan Africa do not have the needed healthcare workers to be able to. But the problem is they also don't have the economy to drive a lot of that correction as well. So if you look at Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia had this problem 20, 25 years ago. 
They made significant investments in health and education, both of which preceded their economic growth by about 10 years. And so they're now in a place where they're, they're sort of a different a trajectory. Um, for many historical reasons we don't have to get into, Africa has been essentially forgotten, uh, other than where many people go to sort of be tourists. And I think that uh, we felt a really moral uh, obligation to go and to change that dynamic and to make a different statement about what is possible and to try to create that equalizer. Um, and that was a big driver for us. Mm. Oh, do you want to? Well, I'll um, respond, just responding to that, um, I would say all of what Vanessa said is true for education as well. <laughs> um, for me, also, in a little bit of a more personal way, um, I when I first went to Kibera, um, where you see Angel, I felt that um, I was there, invited there as an author um, to give a speech. And it was a, a speech for teachers. And so we had a, a classroom and a school. Um, and the teachers came from many, many miles. Um, many of them walked for over a day to come to those trainings. And uh, and I just, I, I felt so inspired by um, the people I met in terms of thinking about those areas that were so hard to reach, not near cities necessarily or cut off from some of the central um, ways that people get access to, tech, to electricity, to quality education. And I thought, what an amazing, um, rich opportunity to partner with such brilliant and wonderful people who have so little but make the most of every step they're taking to get to that training. And I thought, um, I was in another classroom on that very same trip, I was in Liberia, and I was in the classroom actually doing a, a demonstration for teachers about literacy and it was some uh, something, uh, some exercise, and I had given the children um, outside, the children were gathering in the courtyard, and I gave one of the little girls a pack of post-its and a pack of pens like I was using in the classroom to train the teachers. And there are no windows in, in the schools. The, the window, the, the, there's open spaces and the children were peeking in. And this one little girl was just peeking in at me, watching me do my, my lessons with the teachers. So when I went out at the end of the day, she was there doing the exact same lessons with all of the children. There were like 300 children by then. And I thought, well, if we could do that, you know, that's really, that's the answer. Because they, 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 they are so um, ready and it's just uh, amazing. Um, and, and I've been so blessed and inspired to work side by side with such a remarkable um, uh, communities of people. Uh, but LitWorld also um, is, we are in 26 countries. Um, so we're, we're all around the world. Uh, but what I will say is that I like the idea and what we've done is to create models. And so those models, for example, the women um, and men who are lit club leaders in Nairobi, in Kibera, now they went to Uganda and trained people there. So we found that if we could put our model for Lit World in central places around the world, then people really figure out great ways to spread those messages. It's not all on us to do that. Um, and literacy education has best practices, um, just like in medicine, there are best practices that we can share those best practices, but the key is how are they gonna spread? And that's really what people are just so good at doing that. Yes. Uh, question for you, Camp, and that is you mentioned that there's a waiting list for these lit clubs and camps. Is that because of these lit leaders that you, is it hard to find literate adults as well? So, um, the, well, the waiting lists are really because of the, just the sheer numbers uh, and the logistics, but the, the question you're asking about literate adults is that many of our lit club leaders um, are emergently literate also. And so the trainings that we're doing are also accompanying them in that literacy journey too. Um, so we're not excluding any adult who wants to lead and be part of this movement um, because they themselves are also emergently literate as well. Um, a lot of the work we're doing in our lit clubs is about storytelling. It's about listening to your grandmother's stories and then writing them down. And those are things that the adults who lead our clubs are also learning to do. So um, when we're looking at 
um, at best practices, those best practices can be done by everybody. It's not exclusionary to um, train teachers. And I think that was a big, the big aha for Lit World. The idea of Lit World was that we really wanted to really empower that idea on the ground that everybody can be a lit leader. Everybody. There's a question back there. Yeah. English is a second language. Um, no, we're not teaching. We're not teaching English. Um, but a lot of the young people we work with do want to learn English. Um, but the the work is done in the local native languages. It's done in the home languages. So in some cases, the, there's a language like, for example, in Kibera, the language of the community is Swahili. The language in the schools is English. Um, but actually, there are also a lot of mother tongues in the communities, too, that are yet other languages, some of which are not written down. And we leave it to our lit leaders, our mentors, to make decisions about, um, like we have a group of girls in one of our communities that just said, we also really do want to learn English. And so they, they do half their lit club day in English and half in their, in their own home language. Um, in other cases, the, the local leaders make the decision. They know, um, they know best about their communities. So I'm interested in literacy and children learn, young people learn many, they can learn multiple languages. Their, their brains are very open and, and very flexible and they're very capable. Um, some of the books that we share are written in English. In many countries we work in, there's not, not much um, access to children's literature. And so we do get book donations and people share books in English and the children like love those books too and they absorb them and love them. But wherever possible, we're buying locally produced books. So in Haiti, for example, we buy from a local publisher and they publish in Haitian Creole and those are the books the kids use in their lit clubs. But in some places we go, there is no written children's literature and in those cases, we say to the kids in the lit club, you'll have to be the first children's book authors, you know? So, it's great. there's a question here. So it's a great question of how do we source our doctors, nurses, midwives that we train. So we actually partner with the governments in these countries in order to, um, and the countries that we're in are all actually pretty progressive, thoughtful countries. It's part of the reason we chose them specifically. So out of the 59 possibilities in Africa and the many that all have shortages, we're in five. And we all, we targeted countries that had very clear objectives to transform health and to be engaged and to put some skin in the game because we want to work in places where we have partners that are open and want to be engaged and are going to hire the people that we train, be investing back into the system to make sure that we're growing the numbers as well. And so we, we partner with the government to work with public sector training institutions. And what we're, big things we're doing is we're changing the quality of care. Because there's nobody in these hospitals who are overseeing how these doctors, they come out of their didactic classroom training in medical school, and then they're just set loose in the hospital to take care of patients with that. And I can tell you somebody who's gone through residency, my education happened in residency. And that critical clinical oversight for nurses and doctors is really important. So we have changed quality. The heads of institutions have told us they've seen mortality go down since we've been there. And for the first time ever, they have seen graduating students asked to stay on and keep teaching and participating in the system, whereas they were trying to flee to the capital or get out of the country before. And that's been a big change that we've been able to kind of introduce. And so right now, we are ensuring there's enough faculty to teach people, because there are students. In the case of Ethiopia or even in Tanzania and, and Uganda, they've increased the number of students, but they didn't increase the number of faculty. So the ratios were completely off, and we're trying to help step in and also um, protect that. And I think that one of the things we've been able to do by proxy of working the places where we're working is that we've built the trust of the governments in a way that they're now listening and willing to start to make policy changes that are gonna be more effective for 
just you know for the whole health of the education and the and the health system and the prime minister of Uganda just joined our advisory board so to help you know because he and has really been an advocate now with other donors and other people because he has recognized what this means for his country that wants to become a middle income country by 2020 not maybe going to hit that but they realize that health is critical to their getting there and same thing president Sirleaf in Liberia recognized the importance of training healthcare providers if her country was ever going to recover and have a healthy enough population to contribute to the GDP and be able to help her country recover. And so that's exactly what we've been sort of working towards. It's not only be doing the work on the ground, but tackling on a policy level to reset the standard of, of what should be done. Yeah. Could you say something about how the re uh, religious leadership is responding to prevention how is religious leadership responding to prevention education for women? Uh, it's a, Specifically birth control. Yeah, birth control. So depends on the administration the U.S. government has. As you know, you've all seen the sort of the Mexico City rule go like this and the global gag rule and how we're going to treat things. And I think that the local religious leaders um, are, I mean, I think there's huge cultural issues that go outside of religion in many of the places that we're working. The impact of HIV has been so profound in the places where we're working, though, that at least locally, um, in the governments and the countries we're working, there is a real acceptance and understanding of how HIV works and that birth control and family planning has got to be integral to that. And to go one step further, there's now a realization that you can't just counsel a woman. It doesn't work, right? Because many women don't actually have the decisions in their family. You have to counsel the couple together. And so there's been a real shift in some of the places we're working. And a lot of our about third of our physicians and nurses are engaged in women's health and family planning in some capacity, and they're all talking about it full on and trying to create those opportunities and those options. And we're actually about to embark hopefully in a partnership to do more proactive family planning, nor plan IUD placements to be able to sort of empower the, these decisions. In the US, it's a little bit different. One of our chief partners has been the US government and flagship program of the Peace Corps, and we've been limited in what we could do around kind of at least abortion options or some of that family planning just based on the rules and regulations. But SEED has been committed to trying to support options for women and empowering women to make decisions that's independent and outside. That's the advantage of being a 501c3 is that we have the opportunity to set our own agenda. So it hasn't been a huge impact. It's something we always track and are aware of, but I think there's been other aspects of, so traditional medicine, traditional healers, it's been a much bigger issue for us because when the medical system has been so broken and hospitals are a place where you go to die, people turn to traditional healers. The problem with traditional healers is that they just don't have what it takes to actually change the situation. In many cases, they make people worse. That's been a much bigger uphill battle for us to deal with than, say, the religious leadership. Good day. Yeah, I'm. I'm sorry. My whole team is here from Africa, and I've got to get back to meet with them. Why don't? Are they both for me or related? So I'll take them both. And I'll try to answer them quickly. What was yours, and then I'll go to yours. She talked about infrastructure. He's talking about religion and culture. Which is the greater obstacle to literacy and thus education for healthcare providers? Is it culture or is it economy? So I'm going to answer that for medicine. I'm going to defer to Pam to do literacy. I'm going to take the second question and do both. So I understand how seed a good supply of care in these countries, but how do we improve on literacy and knowledge in terms of All awesome questions. So to answer your question, I'm going to be very surgical in my answers to try to get them all done. So to answer your question, well, they're, all the same yeah, question. they're very yes. similar. So I think infrastructure is one of our biggest barriers because I think culture, if we show that you can save patients' lives and hospitals are a place you go to get cared for and to walk out of and to return to your family, 
I think people, the, the, there will be a better trust of, of sort of the system and more investment in it and people will understand its value and demand more of it. So culture to me is very related to what their experience is, which is right now that they have been left sort of to be forgotten and that there is not this idea that there should be the same standard of care. And I think that culture reflects a lot of that. And you still need to integrate culture and you still need to listen and you need to respect that. None of this is to say culture doesn't matter. But I think for right now, the, if you ask for the biggest barrier, now what are the, all the barriers, but the biggest barrier I think is, is kind of the infrastructure and the overall investment to show that the system works. How do we increase numbers? We increase numbers because we are, one, keeping people in the system because they feel inspired and they want to stay and they don't leave, either during or, or at the end of their training. Brain drain has been a huge suck off the system. So people get trained and then they leave and that's a big reason there's the shortages they are. So it's not a lack of people necessarily there. We need more in training per se, but the biggest issue is that people just leave when they're done training. And so we're trying to keep those people in the system and we're seeing that happen. Also, by increasing the number of faculty, you can increase the number of students that come in. And when people are having, and, and the government is more willing to support that and to kind of put in some, some effort and scholarships and create that path forward when they see the system working, we're building the trust with the government to do that. So it's a little bit twofold. Community health workers are critically important as ancillary um, aspects of the healthcare system. And we do train them better. That's a big part of what we're trying to do is to ensure that it isn't just external people coming in, training, and leaving, but that we are constantly investing in that system and integrating into it to provide a, a coverage across the healthcare spectrum and to allow an increase and in upskilling of those that are there. So for example, we just got asked by two of our countries to provide that entire upskilling mechanism so that people who aren't just in who might be a clinical officer and didn't go through medical school can get the higher training to provide a higher level of care for C-sections or for things like that. We've been asked to do all of anesthesia in Liberia, anesthesia in Uganda, and to provide the mechanisms and to do some of that task shifting to increase that level of care. And those are the other ways that we're going to increase the numbers. Doctors, nurses, and midwives are important. They can't be in isolation. We have to task shift. Arguably, we have to do that in this country too, to some degree. But I think that our goal is to provide that really powerful person who can teach across the entire health spe spectrum so that every level of healthcare provider comes up in addition to ensuring the pipeline of those the highest trained. And we have an ambitious goal, without question. There's 83 countries around the world with the critical shortages. We are, know that training takes a long time, but I will guarantee you this, if somebody doesn't dive in, to decide that this has to change and to create the model that other people can replicate and to change the dynamic that exists, we're gonna be in the same place in 20 years that we are today. And I think we fundamentally have to decide that it has to be different. And we know that we're on the path forward to doing that. And it's just been a privilege to be a part of all of this. With that, I'm gonna to sprint to the ferry. Um, and I really wanna thank you everybody for your time and your great questions. It was Awesome. She's going to answer culture and infrastructure and literacy. I have to. Thank you, Thank Vanessa. You so um, let's maybe just uh, take just I don't know how many more minutes we have left. Um, I'll add on to the culture um, economy question because I think it. It is such an important um, question in education also. Um, and, uh, and I think that um, from my perspective as an educator, uh, I think culture is such an asset. Um, I think uh, diversity of language, people's perspectives around um, how they're channeling their history and their ancestors and the importance of the family stories are things that we tend to suppress because we say those things aren't, they don't count. Those things aren't important. We've got to get to the, we've got to get to the meat of it. But if you think of for yourselves, if you think of just in this moment, someone in your life, in your own family who has influenced you, who has meant a lot to you, maybe it was a grandfather, maybe it was an uncle or an aunt, maybe it was your father or your mother, um, every single child in every country I've ever gone to has those same strong feelings, and that's culture. Um, I met Diana uh, in, in Kenya uh, when she was just um, about 10 years old, 
and she was wearing the same uniform every day back and forth to school, and it was just in tatters. And she had one half of a pocket hanging off of her, her jacket, and in that pocket she had one picture of her mother. And the picture was taken by a nurse um, right before her mother died of AIDS. And it was the only picture she had of her mother. And she said, every day I think about my mother. Every day when I come to school, I walk such a long distance to get here, I think my mother would be so proud of me. And I think that, that's culture. The people, uh, I think Vanessa made the point, I think it's a good point for education too, that when she talked about the traditional healers, you think about, in, for example, Sierra Leone or Liberia, where the Ebola crisis was so devastating and a lot of people talked about this idea that they, people were listening more to the traditional healers than they were listening to the doctors saying, don't touch that body, don't wash with that same water, all those things. But actually, I would do the same if I never could trust my hospital system, and I could not trust it. I would trust my grandmother first. I would trust that local person in my community before I would trust someone from the outside. And I think that we have to prove, I think we have to prove our trust. I think that the systems don't work that well. And so in, in education, I can only speak from the point of view of myself as an educator, but the linkage between education and health is so profound. A woman who has even a fifth grade level reading level is 90% more likely to vaccinate her child or to make sure her child gets vaccinated. Think about it. And so that all of those things are so deeply connected that where that child, I, you know, when I think about the child traveling through time, just the way Medina said, time doesn't wait. That child is traveling through time, traveling through, you know, when I picture the child, I picture that she makes that stop at the Lit Club. That's a place she can learn to read, she can learn to write, she can get ownership over her voice so she can say, you know what, I'm not sure I agree with that. I want to make sure that I get the right kind of medical care because what I'm reading is it's really important for us to wash our hands um, after we cook. And those, or before, and before we cook too. And those are all things that are, I think, for myself, what I see about literacy is, literacy is the ultimate self-empowerment because it gives you the agency to decide how and what you want to select from your culture. Not everything about your, your great-grandmother is the thing you want to keep bringing forward, but some things are. And those family stories pushing their way through you, coursing their way through you, the, the gratitude we give, for that person in our life. You know, my father, he died two years ago and he was just an amazing person and he came with me on a lot of these trips I, I go on and um, I, was, we, I was with him in Kenya and he was sitting beside a small child and he had a notebook with him and a pen and he was taking copious notes. He always loved to take notes on everything. He would have been sitting here taking notes, you know. And, um, and, uh, and he came with me, he heard me speak so many times, and he always said, you're just, just great. Every time it's kind of different. And I'd say, Dad, it's because you're always here. I got to mix it up. <laughs> but he was there, and he had the notebook, and he had the pen, and he was taking these notes. And I knew for a fact that this little girl did not speak any English. So I asked him, Dad, what are you writing down? Because I know he doesn't know Swahili. You know what I'm saying? And so he said to me, I'm getting the whole essence. And I thought that's really also culture. It's about transcending culture. We are all human at the end of the day. We find many ways to divide ourselves from each other. But at the end of the day, I'm a daughter, I'm a sister, I'm a mother, I'm a friend. I'm, I'm a passionate mother of my two daughters. I'm a passionate dog mother of my fabulous Labrador retriever, Dewey. And all of those things are things I can relate to people and they can relate to me. And that's the same as I feel that way no matter where I go. And so when we think about what's our obligation, what's the moral obligation we have, what's the thing we can do to make a contribution, is I, I do love this idea. I always think about it when I'm creating things at Lit World, this idea of self, community, and world that this idea that you're, you're nurturing yourself, just as our children are doing in these lit clubs and our lit camps, they're nurturing themselves, they're getting strong so that they can give to their community and then they can give to their world. So it's me, I think of literacy as the ultimate investment. 
Because I love, I love what Vanessa does. I think it's absolutely urgent and important. And in the future, I want every country to have its own doctors and nurses so that they can grow up there. They're, they're rooted in their own communities and they can grow up in the place of their birth and create that, that health for, and wellness for others. Um, but I, I, I think, you know, I think the, 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 the wonder of a panel like this is how closely entwined health and education really are and how powerful that is. And by the way, as Vanessa said too, not just for the other far away person that we can hardly envision, but that child who lives right next door to us, the child who lives right in this community. Um, New York City this year, uh, we, um, our lit camps were in every single classroom in New York City, grades two through eight. The chancellor of New York City said, I like your idea of serious joy, and I want every child to have that. So in our first days of lit camp this summer, we had lit core, our lit core young college students working with us in the classroom, and some of them came to me and said, Pam, it looks like some of the teachers, they're pulling out all the fun stuff. They're pulling out the songs, the games, all the literacy exercises that I was doing in that classroom. They're taking that out. They're saying, we don't have time for this. We have to do test prep. So I called the chancellor's office. I'm like, hello, chancellor? No. Um, and I said, to the, I said to them, you know, if you pull the joy away, there's no empowerment there. It's just one more thing. People are like pouring onto somebody. It's not going to work. But the thing about young people is I think that we, with young people, I think that we think anything that's fun is not good for them. Isn't that true? As soon as they're reading, if they're reading a comic book over the summer, we're like, mm, mm, mm. Is that required reading? Don't we do that? But we shouldn't do that. Because really, that idea of serious joy, it's everyone deserves it. And what, what's happening now in New York City to see us closing that literacy gap in New York City because we're putting that idea of the serious joy of learning to read in the center is something I want for everybody, anywhere. It's just going to make us all stronger. We don't want to have, nobody should be dependent. Everybody should be empowered. Everybody should be the girl who, who can fish. Any other questions, wonderings? Yes. So I understand the concept of you having, um, t teaching people to be teachers and, and spreading in that way and, and making it sustainable. I'm curious uh, to find out more about your actual model of, of instruction. And so how, how can we talk yes. more about that? Yes. Yes. So, um, and I know we probably have to end because I think this does officially end now. So one more minute. Perfect. So I'll answer this good question. Because the question is really about how does this model work? Um, how do we scale? And so um, I'll tell you in a nutshell, because I, I think it's kind of amazing um, in the way that scale does seem kind of daunting. Any of you who run a business or are you just thinking about anything you love that you want to scale, it's just hard to do. It's hard to make that happen. Um, and so, but from the beginning I said, I, I know this, this, this really works, the way we do this work. We start with the power of children's own stories. We start with the power of children's literature. We start with the power of the local community. And then the way we make it grow is the training part of it. And I think that might be what you're asking, and I'll just end with that, is that we started Lit World in 2007 when technology was kind of rough and raw. People were doing a little bit of like Facebook messaging. People were doing some like far-flung WhatsApp text messaging kinds of things. And I had a very small team and I said, is this stuff free? And my younger colleagues were like, yeah. And I said, then, then we are definitely doing that. Because one of the things my, my learning from my, my grandmothers was use what you have. And so we took Facebook and we started to do trainings on Facebook. We would just say, come to Lit World's Facebook page, and we're going to be there to do some work with you on literacy. And it's free. And guess what? Everybody has that Facebook app, no matter where I've been in the world, no matter what kind of phone it is, somehow everyone has Facebook. The second thing we did is we started using a lot of video. So we started doing a lot of video Skype and Google Hangouts, and whether we're doing trainings in Detroit, or California, or Haiti, or Kenya, or Liberia, 
You know, traveling to Detroit is actually more expensive than traveling to Liberia. It's like the hardest place to get to from New York City for some weird reason. And so we didn't want to spend the money on that. I'd rather spend the money on books for kids. And I'd rather spend the money to invest in the local community. So we do a lot of video training. And we identify the leaders in the community, and then those, those people, old and young, go back out to do that same thing, just like that little girl in Liberia was peeking in at me in the window. That's what we do. So I'll just end with the idea of windows, because I mentioned them a few times. The first time I went to Kenya, I noticed that every time I took a picture, and you know you can see in the viewfinder, you can see the picture you just took, and I would turn the picture around and I would show the camera to the kids and I could see they were so riveted. And then I realized it was the first time many of them actually saw themselves. What do I look like? Because there were no windows, so there was no reflection. There were no mirrors, because that's really like a luxury to have a mirror. There were no mirrors and there were no windows. Think of it. So I would say, look, yes, that's a great picture. And then one of the children would say to me, is that me? And I'd realize that is exactly what literacy does. It's about looking, when I read Anne of Green Gables, when I'm 10 and I say, that's me, I'm Anne, I'm feisty, spelled with an E. Or I read about Joe and Little Women, I say, that's me, I'd sell my hair to help my family. Or I write in the garret all those 27 books I've written, that's all because of Joe from Little Women. It's looking at myself in the mirror. And then there are some great, great researchers whose shoulders I stand on in the work who also said, if we're going to look at children's learning as this idea of mirrors and windows, looking out into the world and seeing something you didn't know, maybe it's about girls going to high school. Maybe it's about boys becoming ballet dancers. Who knows what it is? But it's the world is yours when you look through the window and you see, I could be a writer. I could be Anne. I could be feisty. Maybe I'm not exactly like that, but I could become like that. That's the mirrors and the windows of children's lives. And that's really what literacy does. It says, I am here. And it also says, I can be there. So with that, my website is litworld.org. And we love to invite you to join in this movement. It's such a joyous, joyous movement. And there's plenty of ways to help. So please come visit me there. And I thank everyone for being here and for inviting me here.